depending on God. That is all, those are all the things that we do to gain hope in Christ. We can't live the way we want and then expect to be filled with hope and joy and peace and love and all these things that make us feel good if we're not living the way that we should. But we want to talk about that this morning. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope, hashtag hope, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so I'm going to break this verse down into four different parts, and we're going to just dissect it and look phrase by phrase. There's a mental condition that's essential, essential to the life that God wants us to live. It's the fuel that our heart runs on. America might run on Dunkins, but we don't run on Dunkins, people. At least these last 21 days, we haven't, hopefully. We run on hope. We run on the word of God. That's how we function. It's the single biggest difference between those who persevere and those who give up. It's the powerful force that causes your mind to explore every possibility and overcome every obstacle. It's a simple little word with endless amounts of power. That simple little word is hope. Job 11.18 says, Having hope will give you courage. You will be protected and you will rest in safety. Another scripture that I don't have a slide for, Paul, not to mess you up. I just threw this in here a little bit ago. Hebrews 6.19, hope is the anchor of our soul. Okay, so you know what an anchor is, right, that goes on a ship. And it, they, when, when the ship wants to stay in port or stay wherever, they put, they put down this anchor and it goes down to the bottom of the ocean. And it holds that huge ship in place. This, I love this verse because that, that verse references that, showing that hope, my hope in God anchors me, anchors me in life. Because there are going to be, and there have been, and there will be, so many things that want to uproot you and upset you and, and unsettle you. But if you have hope in your heart, you will be anchored. First of all, in this scripture in Romans, in, in, uh, Romans 15, 13, uh, it's first of all referring to the hope that we have eternal life. The hope in the promise of eternal life. We can confidently lay our eternal future in God's hands because of what Christ has done for us. But, you know, God also wants us to enjoy life now. Now, I don't mean enjoy it the way we think we should be enjoying it. I mean enjoy it abundantly with love and peace and hope. And you're going to hear me say these three or four words over and over and over again. Get used to it. Because my, what I want to uh, communicate to you today is you can live in hope and peace and joy. You can get there. And we're going to talk about how we can get there. Hope, joy, and peace are ingredients that we need in great measure if we are to live a productive and fruitful and successful Christian life, both for us personally and for those around us. See, we are not an island unto ourselves. We cannot live life the way that we want and not think that it affects those around us for good or for bad. Our choices for good affect those around us for good. Our choices for bad affect those around us for bad. We are not an island unto ourselves. So we're going to talk about that this morning. We hope for a lot of things. I hope it doesn't snow. Well, we all hope it doesn't snow. Like, we really hope it doesn't snow. I hope it doesn't rain. Actually, we're glad it rained yesterday because if it didn't rain, it would have snowed. I hope it's not too hot. I hope it's not too cold. I hope I get the job. I hope I like my boss. I hope I get a raise. I hope I make a good mother. I hope the rose comes out okay. I hope I make a good father. I hope I don't get sick. I hope I like the food. I hope, I hope, I hope. If we were to walk around with a tape recorder just for one day and find out how many times we say the word or the phrase, I hope, I hope, I hope. I'm not talking about that phrase this morning. I'm talking about real lasting hope, not the kind that can be manufactured. Not the kind that's wishful thinking. Not the kind that lets me down time and again. But the kind of hope that never, never 
never, never, never will fail you. It will never, never fail me. Hope in God. We're going to look at four parts. Number one, we're going to recognize his job. Number two, we're going to recognize our need. Number three, we're going to recognize our job. Number four, we're going to recognize the effect. So let's look at number one. Recognize his job, okay? God's job. We have to stop trying to do God's job. Let him do his job. May the God of hope, another translation says the God who gives hope, may the God of hope. That's why it's his job, because he's the God of hope. You are not my hope. I am not your hope. Pastor Richard is not your hope. Your spouse is not your hope. Your kids turning out okay isn't your hope. Those things are not your hope. A good job, a nice house, a nice car, nice clothes, nice friends, nice family. That is not what we are supposed to place our hope in. People like to have a job description. When you go to get a job, do you like a job description? You want to know what's expected of you. You want to know what you're supposed to do and when you're supposed to do it and how you're supposed to do it. We like a job description. We like to know what's expected. Well, I'm here to tell you God's job description is to supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. It's not your job. Stop trying to do his job. Do your own job, and we're going to get to that. But don't try to do God's job. God is not a haphazard God. He's not over here and over there and all over the place not knowing what's going on. He is not. He's not just working in your life, and then Wednesday night he'll be working in your life, and then next Sunday he'll be working in your life. He is working in all of our lives right now. All the things in our lives that are happening, good or bad, my hope is in him that he's going to work it all together for my good and for your good. Nothing takes God by surprise. I love that thought. When we are shocked, when we are shaken to the very core by something that's hit our lives, tragedy or a lost job or bad health or a loss of a loved one, God is not taken by surprise. And I love that because that ensures me again, I can put my hope in God that no matter what is happening in my life, he is in control. If you have the view of God that, well, he's not really in control and he didn't, he, 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 he's not working in this area and he, that's not right that he let that happen and, and, and you're feeling like you're not growing in your spiritual walk with God and you're not getting anywhere and you just think this is all a waste of time, I would challenge you this morning, check your prayer time, check your Bible reading time, check your church attendance, which of course you're here, Check your ministry involvement in the local body. Check who you're hanging around with, spending your time with, texting, tweeting, calling, Facebooking. What are you doing with your time? And especially those two, prayer and reading of the word. Because if you're in the word and you're a person of prayer, then all the other things and people and situations, those are going to begin to fall to the wayside. You're going to begin to recognize, maybe this isn't so good for me. Maybe this television series... Nighttime soap operas really is all it is, is garbage, garbage in, garbage out. If you're a woman and a man of prayer, a young person of prayer and the word, you're going to begin to recognize when you turn that TV on to watch your weekly thing, you're going to go, Ugh, this doesn't quite feel right, and you're going to shut it off. Don't try to change everything in your life. Just get with God. Learn how to pray. Learn how to read the word. The devil will fight that. I will give that a little disclaimer. He will fight it. He will not allow you to just, he will not gracefully let you just go live a Christian life. He will fight it every step of the way. I've been following the Lord for many, many, many years, and he still hasn't given up chasing me. And he won't. And I need to recognize that. Because the day you think the devil's done with you, you're going to fall because he's not. And you've got to recognize it, and you've got to be ready. You've got to have a life filled with hope so when the enemy comes against you and lies to you, you can say, oh, no, mm -mm, I serve the God of hope. And you can sing, he's under my feet. That's where he is. That's where he belongs. That's where he needs to stay. But if you're not living a life full of hope and joy and peace, he's going to keep controlling your emotions. He's going to keep pulling you this way and pulling you that way. If you're allowing him to do only so much in your life, 
then you have not allowed him and I have not allowed him to be the God that he wants to in our lives. Let him show up. I mean, what do we come in here for Sunday after Sunday after Wednesday after Wednesday? What are we here for? Just to hear a message and then go home and live like whatever? No, we are here. I am here. I am here to learn, to grow, to be at the altars, to hear the preaching of the word. I am here to learn. You are here to learn so that when we leave here, we're encouraged, we're fired up, and we're ready to go face the world and face the enemy and read the Bible throughout the week and pray every day throughout the week so that when we come back, and I've said this before, Sunday isn't, isn't a pep rally. I don't, I don't, I've never used pom-poms in worship leading, Vilma. Have you? No. Not a pep rally. It's a culmination of what God's done in your life all week. So you come in here and you can't wait to get to this altar and worship God and tell him, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's a culmination of a, wor- of a week that you've gone to work and you've had your kids and you've been busy, but you've made time for God every day. So when you come here, we are rejoicing together. That's what worship services are all about. And if you're coming in here week after week and you don't have that, that worship, then, you, then, then you're not allowing God to do what he wants in your life. You're not allowing him. Allow him. There's an old song I love. I'm going to read just some of the lines with it. God is bigger than all my problems, bigger than all my fears. God is bigger than any mountain that I can or cannot see. Bigger than all the shadows that fall across my back. Bigger than all the confusion, bigger than anything. Bigger than all the giants, fear and unbelief. Bigger than all my hang-ups, bigger than anything. God is bigger than any mountain that I can or cannot see. What a good little tune to get in your mind and sing throughout the day. Because if you can get If you can get this understanding that he's bigger than anything that comes your way and he can handle anything that comes your way, the way you live on a daily basis will be so different. You will face those things head on because you'll have that hope in God that he's going to bring you through. He will never fail you. If you were to walk up to me today and say, God did fail me once, I would say, no, he did not fail you. You've got to walk in hope. When your world is suddenly turned upside down, remember God's plans for your life have not changed. When you feel trapped with no way out, just stop and look for signs of God's presence in your life. When you feel trapped, when you feel discouraged, just stop, open the Bible, or open your journal where maybe you've written promises from God, Put on the worship music and look for signs of God's presence in your life. They are there. We have to look for them. When all else fails, go back to the word. You know, we hear that phrase, when all else fails, pray. No. Listen, first of all, be in the word. Second of all, be in prayer. Not when all else fails. If all else keeps failing in your life, then maybe because we're not in the word. And we're not in prayer. Psalm 46, I don't have a slide for this either, Paul. 46.5, God will help you at the break of day. God will help you at the break of day. I love that. Daybreak is a symbol of new beginnings, right? We go to bed at night. We get up the next morning. It's a new day. My husband used to sing um, this little tune in the morning. Wake up, everybody. No more sleeping in bed. No more backward thinking, time for thinking I had. Now, the only thing is, the little kid's getting into it. That was good. He got the groove back there. He'd be doing that when my kids were sleeping. They didn't really like that too much. Wake up, everybody, no more sleep. But you know what? Daybreak is a brand new beginning. And we've got to face it as a brand new day. Lamentations, I love, love, love this scripture. 332, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end, and they are new every morning. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will never change. Now, see, if you're not in the Word, you're not going to know these promises. If you're not reading your Bible, of which we still have 
a dozen or so of the year-long Bibles out there, go get one. It'll help you in your Bible reading. If you're not reading the Bible, you're not uh, uh, exposing yourself to these wonderful promises of God. Psalm 46.10, simple verse. Be still and know that I am God. That verse just carries peace. Say it with me. Be still and know that I am God. He's God. He's the God of hope. It's his job. Number two, we need to recognize our need. We've got to recognize his job as the God of hope, and we've got to recognize our need to be filled with joy and peace. Now, I need today to be refilled with joy and peace. Anybody else? Then you've just recognized it. Recognized your need. That wasn't that difficult, was it? But God can't fill us with his joy and peace if we're filled with restlessness, anxiety, stress. I hear people say, I am so stressed today. I'm so stressed. This stresses me. Stress, 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 stress. You are speaking it right into your life. When you feel stressed, say, you know what? I am filled with hope today. I am filled with hope today. The hope of God working in my life. We need to ask God to empty us of those things, of all that anxiety and stuff that we carry. Many times we gain a false hope when things in our lives look good. Now listen to this, because this is important, and this is something I've really grown to recognize and learn in my own life. I've learned that we can't go for one second by what we see, whether bad or good, whether negative or positive. Because people tend to live by their emotions. I know men say women are very emotional. Well, men can be pretty emotional too from what I've seen of some men. So one day things might look bad and we feel down. The next day things might look good and we feel better. But then the next day they're down. And then the next week they're up. And then the next month, they're down. And so we're going by what we see. That's not real hope. That's a false sense of security and hope. Because things will always get bad, good, bad, good, bad, good. Then they'll be good for maybe a long time. And then something else is bad. And then we're constantly being dragged up and down by our emotions. We cannot live fruitful, productive Christian lives when we are living by our emotions. <clears throat> Because things can quickly change. That's why it's always good to remind ourselves of 2 Corinthians 5.5. 5, we walk by faith, not by sight. By trust, not by feelings. I have learned to live in the kind of hopeful expectation. Now, I'm not telling you I never have a bad moment, a bad season, a bad day. But I don't stay there. I don't live there. I don't unpack my bags there. I pass through there and remember, oh, wait, I have hope. Jesus is the same in my life today as he was yesterday and he will be tomorrow. That's right. I don't need to live in this despair. Feelings go up and down. We've got to walk by faith. We've got to get this. We've got to get this, my friends. We want to abound in hope. We can be so rich and strong in hope that no matter how severe the trial or test, we don't waver in our faith with God. Now, please, don't wait for the trial or tragedy or test to come your way to decide, I need to get hope now. Get it beforehand so that when it comes your way, you don't get plowed over, but you can stand firm. Yes, you might shake a little bit. You might weep. You might be frustrated, but you give your frustration to God, and you get back in his word, and you remind yourself of the things and the promises that he's spoken to you, and then you can stand firm. I have a friend um, from a, a, another local church in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, actually. And several months ago, her son was in a severe car crash. And um, the driver that caused the accident was killed. And her son actually saw him ejected from that vehicle. And her son, I believe he's 21, sustained s severe injuries. It, really a miracle of God 
And I believe it was the protection of the prayers of a Christian mother that kept that kid alive. He broke bones in his face, his arms, his legs, his feet, and um, looked bad. His car, I don't even know how he got out of it. She showed me the pictures. But through it all, this was her phrase, he's got this. He's got this. God's got this. And I'm not talking about that pat little superficial thing. I'm talking about that real, he's got this. Several weeks later, she was on the highway. Car was totaled. She sustained minor injuries. What do you think she said through that? Really, God? No. He's got this. He's got this, people. I don't know what you're going through. You don't know what I'm going through, but I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he's got this. He's got it in your life. He is control of what's happening in your life. Things happen that aren't fair. Her son was just driving along, minding his own business, and someone else going on the on-ramp when they should have been going on the off plowed into him. That wasn't his fault. That isn't fair. It's not right. Life is not fair. And life is not right. And in life, people get hurt. But God's got this. What an example this woman is to me. God's got this. I want to be filled with joy and peace and hope. I want to walk in joy and peace and hope. I want to go to sleep with joy and peace and hope. I want to rise in the morning with joy and peace and hope. Not that feeling of dread. You know that feeling of dread? That oppressive feeling of dread that can come upon us? I don't want to live like that. And I know what both of them feel like. I know what it's like to put my head on the pillow at night filled with dread and fear and anxiety. I know what it's like to wake up in the morning and not have one tiny part of me that wants to get out of that bed because I'm just filled with that dread and fear. I know what it's like to go out throughout my day distracted and worried and full of anxiety. I do. But I also know what it's like to live in joy and peace and hope. And I choose joy and peace and hope. I have to make that choice. No matter what's going on in my life, I have to make the choice. You have to make the choice. Is it an easy place to get to? No way. No way. It's not easy. But I know when I make that decision to get up, and as Pastor Richard talked about last week, and he's going to be talking about that a little bit more, arise, get up. What are you doing? Get up. Sometimes we've literally got to get up from that place that we are, not the chair, not your seat, not the couch, not the bed, but the place that we're in inside. We're cowering. We're living under that defeat. How are you doing? Well, pretty good under the circumstances. What are you doing under the circumstances? Get up. We can't live under them. We've got to live on top of them. And it's not easy. It's hard. I've had to learn this, and I know I'm going to have to learn it some more. But I'm here to tell you it works. When you work on your relationship with God and you get in the word and in prayer and you get filled with hope and joy and peace, your Christian walk will be different. It will be different. You begin to see things different. I've had to learn to not look right here, but while my head is facing this direction, my eyes are actually going up to the hills and to the mountains. That's where my help comes from. They referred to it this morning, but not the mountain itself, the God of the mountain, the God of the universe, the God of your life. He's in control. I can stand firm on what he promises to me in Philippians 4.19. Say it with me. Is it up there? And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. What do you need today? Yes, that refers to finances. And yes, most people think about finances. But this scripture says all your needs. What do you need today? Do you need hope and joy and peace? My God, your God, if you're allowing him to be your God in your life, he will supply those things in an abundant supply in your life. 
Okay, number three, we have to recognize our job. Well, you say, how do we have a job? Aren't we supposed to let God? Well, yes, we are supposed to let God, but there's one thing he asks us to do. As you trust in him. As you trust in him. Our job, trust in him. That's all. Trust. Trust in God. We need to learn to react to situations with hopefulness and with trust instead of despair. Oh, my gosh, you'll never believe what happened in my life this week. You'll never believe what God's doing in my life this week through a situation that came. How about that reaction? The only way to learn this is to read his word and be a person of prayer. If you want to learn how to have faith and trust in God, you need to read the word. You will hear that from this pulpit until Jesus returns to take us home that you need to be people of prayer and the word. If not, you will dry up like one of those fall leaves. It falls to the ground so pretty, and then a few months later it's dried up and crackled, and when you step on it, it breaks into a gazillion pieces. That's what we are as a Christian without the word and prayer. We dry up. Without it, you won't learn to trust. Without it, you won't read the promises that were written for you. Without it, you won't know that others who have gone before you have experienced the same trials, and they learn to walk in faith and hope. All God is asking of us is to trust him at his word. No one likes to have their word challenged. When you give your word to someone and say that you'll do something, do you like it when somebody says, are you really going to do it? You don't like that. Well, God doesn't like it either. That's offensive to God because he is a God of hope, and he's the God of the universe. And he's the God that sent his son to die on a brutal, bloody cross for us. And yet we sometimes doubt his word. Can't doubt his word. God's not like people. People fail us. They give us their word and they don't follow through. God is not like that. His word's true. His word is sure. And he always comes through on his word. There's a song I used to sing many years ago. And the title was, He is Able. And I wanted to read three short lines from this. It says, and if he chooses not to move in the way we prayed he would, knowing that he's working all together for my good, I will stand behind his word for he is able. I will stand behind God's word. I will stand firmly on his word. I will stand with his word surrounding me, knowing that he is able. Viktor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor, and he said this, A weak faith is weakened by predicaments and catastrophes, whereas a strong faith is strengthened by them. Friends, listen to me. Whatever God is allowing in your life, he's allowing. Some things he sends, some things he allows. And whatever it is, he's allowing it for a reason. Don't waste the trial. Don't waste the test. Don't let it go by and have it, have it, have it, have it, having weakened you, whatever the predicament is. It's weakened you. No, let God use it to strengthen you so that when that other trial comes, and it will, when the other trial comes, you're stronger to face it. That's the whole idea. We get stronger to face these things. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is confidence in what we hope for. My confidence is in God and assurance for what we don't see. And that's the whole idea, to believe for things that we don't yet see. When Pastor Richard was preaching, I don't know, a couple of months ago, he said something about prayer and changing. And, and I sat there and I quickly wrote out this thing that came to my mind, and I've used it a few times. It's not really that, like, deep, but it's just kind of cool, I think. And this is what it is. There it is. Prayer not only changes things, prayer changes me while I wait for things to change. Wow, have I learned that in my life. And if you're going to retweet that, I totally want credit for it. So that's good. See, prayer will change situations in God's timing, and in God's way, not not always our way, but I have seen prayer change me while I'm praying for the situation. 
It's changing me. It's helping me to wait. It's helping me to have hopeful, hopeful expectation. It's helping me to learn how to pray. I mean really pray and wait and be patient. It's changing me. If we would always get things when we wanted or see prayers answered right away, there'd be no need of faith. But he, he strengthens us when we pray. James 1.6 says, Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a sea, a wind of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Another translation, I don't have Paul, but I'm just going to read it. Ask boldly, believingly, without a second thought. This is from the message. People who worry their prayers, oh God, I don't know what I'm going to do if you don't. That, like, what are you doing? That's not even prayer. That's moaning and groaning. What you're going to say is, God, change me while I'm waiting because I know that you're going to change that situation. I know you're going to turn things around for my good. We can't go to God and moan and groan. When I was a little girl and we would whine, my mother would say, I don't hear that whining voice. I know God hears no matter what voice we use, but I don't think he likes to hear the whining voice. He likes to hear voices of faith. And he responds to voices of faith. Don't think, the rest of this scripture, don't think you're going to get anything from the master that way. Adrift at sea, keeping all your options open. Don't think you're going to get anything. Because you're not praying in faith. You're not praying and believing. Imagine a giant storm at sea and the waves are crashing. That's what our prayers look like when we're asking in doubt. to have faith again if you don't have faith just take a minute and look at your prayer life psalm 16 11, you make known to me the path of life in your presence there is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore or another translation your presence makes our joy complete getting into his presence means praying pushing waiting worshiping praising Praying, pushing, waiting, it's, 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 it's never-ending. you got to keep going at it. You can't get up from a place of prayer and say, oh, I'm done, I never have to do that again. It's hard to get into God's presence sometimes because of the distractions. That's why I tell people on a Sunday morning, don't get up, get dressed, eat, and come to church. Get up, get dressed, eat, and pray and come to church so that you leave those things behind. And you come into his presence ready to worship. Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold unswervingly without wavering to the hope we, we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Or another translation, because God can be trusted to keep his promise. So number four, let's recognize the effect. We've recognized God's job. We've recognized our need. We've recognized our job. Now let's recognize the effect. The last part of that verse 13, that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So many around us today are living without hope. So many people around us are living without hope. Not just in our secular world, but in the church. Living without hope. Some people are like mannequins. They're all dressed up, but going nowhere. Hopeless. Just mannequins. But as a follower of Christ, we do not have to live like that. We don't have to live like that. We can live in joy and hope and peace and confidence. Our hope isn't luck, like winning the lottery. $1.6 billion Powerball ticket. First of all, before you ask, I will answer, no, I do not play the lottery. You know what the chances were in winning that? One in 292,201,338. One person out of 292,201,338 people were going to win that. That was your odds. God's not like that. God is not a God of luck. Well, maybe if I ask, maybe he'll choose me to work in my life. No, 
You raise your hand to God, you pray, you seek his word, you seek his face, you seek his will. There's no luck involved. He will work in your life. I'm glad we don't serve a God with those kind of odds. I mean, that's, those kind of odds are crazy. It's confidence that God will do what he said. And nobody knew this better than David. He had every reason to lose hope. After Samuel anointed him to be Israel's next king, he had to wait for seven years while a paranoid ruler occupied the throne, a maniac ruler. He had to flee for his life. Sam, uh, uh, Saul, was trying to, Saul was trying to kill David. He had to hide in caves surrounded by enemies. David saw Israel devastated. He saw his friends killed. He saw his family taken captive. But he never wavered or threw in the towel. So many Christians today are throwing in the towel and giving up. I can't do this anymore. I'm walking away from God. Don't do that. Where in the world are we going to go if we do that? Where are we going? Back to that life? No. If David could live his life with unwavering faith in God and you open up the book of Psalms and you will read about it, then we can. Faced with circumstances that would wipe many of us out, he said in Psalm 39, 7, my hope is in you. My hope is in you. Psalm 71, 5, for you are my hope, Lord God. You are my trust from my youth. Psalm 30, verse 5, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Joy comes, it comes. In other words, it's going to get better. I can't guarantee how things are going to turn out, but I know we get better, and I know God turns it all around for my good. What that devil brings against us, what God allows in our lives, what God sends our way is trial and testing. He turns it around for our good if we keep our hope in him. And when those around you see the hope that you have, no matter what you're going through, they will want to know where that hope is coming from. I have, uh, I asked permission from my friend to read this. I have a friend who posted something on Facebook recently. And I just loved it because it has so much to do with hope. She lost her husband at a very young age. And this is what she said. I am not strong in my own right or strength. I am only strong in that my hope is in God through Jesus Christ. If you look at me and only see what you perceive to be a strong woman, then I have failed. We are coming on five years now that my husband has gone, and I only attribute any strength and health to God and to those whom I surround myself with. Don't look to the outside only without digging deeper to see what's been going on inside of me over time. Don't think you are an exception and can't receive help because it's for the strong. Think about how a person becomes strong. Listen whether it be physical, emotional, spiritual strength that you seek. It all comes through pain. Now, this is from a woman who lost her husband, and she had two young daughters. It all comes through pain, hard times, consistently, consistency, discipline, and great support. I am only here by the grace of my Lord and Savior. If you don't believe me, read my post from the past five years or take my word for it. This is a woman who lost her husband. I believe he was early 40s. I am only strong in that I have my hope in God. And she said, if you look at me and only see what you perceive to be a strong woman, then I have failed. And I have seen the hope of God in her life as she has walked this journey of absolute heartache. I've seen hope rise in her life. And so what are people seeing around us? Despair, depression, anxiety, irritability, or are they seeing hope? What are they seeing around us? I know what the people around her saw, even in the workplace, in the secular world. They saw hope. Her life spoke of a hope in Jesus Christ that no matter what rocked her world, she still had hope in God, that he was still going to bring her through that trial, that tragedy. He was still going to bring her through. That's what people saw. What do people see in our lives? Do they see God? Do they see the God that you say you serve? Do they see peace and joy and encouragement? Or do they see worry, anxiety, and restlessness? Or do they even see Jesus at all? 
We're not the only reason that we need to be filled with joy and peace and hope. Those around us, they need to see it. If those around us don't see it, what chance do they have of knowing what hope in God is? They need to see how a Christian responds when tragedy hits their family, when their boss is mistreating them, when they're faced with a health crisis, when they get laid off from their job, when they're faced with a financial crisis. How are those around us viewing us as Christians? When we come to a service like today or a ladies or a men's meeting or whatever, wherever we're coming together as the body of Christ, are we exhibiting lives of faith and joy and peace or are we the kind of person that no one really wants to ask the question, how are you? I don't want to be one of those people that when I'm asked how are you, I unload all this garbage and negativity and mistrust of God. Romans 15, 13. Let's look at it one more time before we pray. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you want hope this year in your life to overflow Father, I thank you that you are the God of hope. I thank you that this morning we are recognizing our need to be filled with your joy and peace. Thank you this morning that we are recognizing our job is to simply trust you through prayer, through reading the word, through changing how we speak. That's our job, Lord. I thank you this morning that we are recognizing the need of the effect on those around us when we are filled with hope and joy and peace, God. Father, I pray that when we leave here today, we even go home and we take this verse, Romans 15, 13, and we study it and we read it and we memorize it and we say it out loud throughout the day that we can begin to be uh, newly filled and freshly filled with your joy and your peace, God. Empty us of all the anxiety, of all the garbage, all the stuff that so keeps us under everything and burdened and oppressed. Empty us of that today, Father. Thank you for your people, God. I pray whatever they're going through in their life right now, heavy things, God, heavy duty situations that are too heavy for them, that they would simply learn to lay it at your feet, trust you, pray, seek you, worship you, get in your word, and that we will become different we will grow more like you and that those around us will see the difference, God. They will see you in us, Lord. We thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Take this word. Take the scripture. Have a wonderful week. And keep saying every day, I hope it doesn't snow. I hope it doesn't snow. I hope it doesn't snow. God bless you guys.